Today's episode is with Dr. Brant Courtright. He's the author of the Amazon number one bestseller, Holistic Healing for Anxiety, Depression, and Cognitive Decline. He's a professor emeritus with the California Institute of Integral Studies. Um, he's also a licensed clinical psychologist with a private practice in San Francisco, as well as online. Um, he has been an online coaching and consultation um, specialist with a practice focused on brain health, anxiety, depression, and cognitive health for many years. Um, this honestly was a very impacting episode for me. I could literally just feel the truth of what Dr. Courtright is teaching through the energy that he expresses. You'll feel it immediately. Um, he is so wise. He's really on the cutting edge of everything that I think most of us who are into holistic health are into, but he has so much experience combined with so much passion for what's new. Um, he just really has brought basically human health all together in a nice package. I know this is for anxiety, depression, and cognitive decline, but really like if you live by the principles that he's teaching, it's prevention as well. And it truly is just human health. I was like, he gets it. He completely gets it. And he's going into the mind and the body and the heart, the spirit, all of it, and really breaking it down into a simple step-by-step -step, um, path. I really, I honestly, like I could not stop thinking about this episode for days after we recorded it. Um, I just think he is incredible. And I highly recommend sending this episode to like anyone, you know, and love because there's so much wisdom in it. Um, but if you are looking into this episode for anxiety and depression or cognitive dec decline, I mean, this is it like everything. This is a huge area of research for me as well. And it's everything that I've been able to come across that has actually turned the needle for people. He's hitting on it right here. And he just has so many incredible insights on top of anything else that I found. So huge fan of Dr. Courtright and really, really enjoy this episode. I hope you guys do too. Here is Dr. Brant Courtright. So I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite finds in the health industry in the last few years. It's something I use with all my clients, and that has been extremely impacting on me as well. And that's the upgraded formulas, hair mineral tests, their consults, and their nanoparticle size minerals. So um, I started on this path because I was taking in a high quality magnesium. And when I tested, I found out that I was extremely deficient in magnesium. And once I started using their nanoparticle size magnesium, my levels went right up. And what I experienced was incredible. I started getting more REM sleep. I was, I realized I hadn't been dreaming in years, started dreaming again, and also noticed that I didn't think I had anxiety until I got my magnesium back up and noticed that I was experiencing quite a lot of anxiety and that went away. And I was able to enter back into a place of calm and peace. And, um, it was just incredible. And so since then I've been using it with all of my clients and it's so easy. All you have to do, they'll mail you out a little envelope and you just put some hair in it and mail it back into their lab. And then you do a consult with them over the phone and they'll tell you all about your ratios, what's high and what's low, because you can't know this unless you test, there's no way to know. And you you can't just crap shoot minerals. You have to make sure that your ratios are on point. So they will tell you exactly what you need more of exactly what you need less of to get those ratios on point. So you can have optimized brain health and hormones and sleep and metabolism. So, um, they're also giving you 10% off for being an inside out health listener. So that code is just inside out. So, um, go to upgradedformulas.com and just enter inside out at checkout and you'll get 10% off their consults, um, the hair tests and any products that you may need to get your ratios, right? So, um, yeah, take advantage of it guys. It's something I use with every single one of my clients. It's been wildly impacting and I'm happy to be able to extend that discount on to you guys too, as a thank you for listening to the podcast. All right. So Dr. Courtright, could you please help us understand the gravity of the problem with anxiety and depression right now, as we're seeing it, you know, from your perspective, I know for me, this is something that I'm seeing in practically every client I'm working with on some sort of sliding scale. Um, so could you give us some info on, you know, from your perspective, how bad the problem really is in regards to depression and anxiety? Yeah, it's huge. We're in the midst of an epidemic or a pandemic of anxiety and depression, just as the COVID epidemic. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> one quarter of women, American women between 25 and 45 are on an antidepressant. Um, the, the college counseling centers are completely overwhelmed at this point. Mm -hmm. um, according to the National Institutes of Mental Health, 38% of girls between 13 and 17 have an anxiety disorder and 26% of boys. So that's over a third of the girls 
and over a quarter of the boys, teenage boys, have diagnosable anxiety disorders. What qualifies as an anxiety disorder versus just anxiety? Um, it's where it's pervasive, okay. where it begins to interfere with your social relationships, begins to interfere with your life, where it really is inhibiting. Okay. Um, and below that, at the sub sort of diagnosable level, we have chronic stress. Most people are pretty stressed out these days. And yeah. again, COVID has made this exponentially worse. So yeah. it's huge. It's really yeah, huge. Totally. Um, so what about um, in adults? Um, okay. So again, in adults, this is also going through the roof. Um, as of May, um, prescriptions for antidepressants and anti-anxiety agents were up by over a third. By now, it's probably wow. well beyond that. Wow. So part of the problem of this, in my own perspective, is that it's all being over-medicated. Yeah. Medica <laughs> psychiatric medication is, can be a lifesaver at times to get through a really rough patch. But in my opinion, it's being way, way, way over-prescribed. And the problem is that it simply suppresses symptoms. Right. It doesn't really heal the underlying brain dysfunction or psychological issues that are going on. So right. the, the book is Holistic Healing for Anxiety, Depression, and Cognitive Decline. So it's a holistic approach, meaning we are psychophysical beings. Yeah. We are both a brain and we are a self. Yeah. And we need to address this from both sides because both sides of our existence are mm -hmm. under attack. Mm, I love this so much. Okay. So yeah, like I, I admit for me as a, as a health professional, I, it's frustrating sometimes because I'll get a client and they're like, well, I'm on, you know, I'm on Wellbutrin and uh, Lexapro and I'm on, I'm on SSRIs and, um, also, you know, things to, to inhibit, uh, dopamine and norepinephrine. And, and then, and then uh, later I went to this doctor, I found out I have low vitamin D, low thyroid function, all these health problems, inflammation. I have trauma from childhood that I haven't addressed. I just went through a divorce. My dad just died. And <laughs> none of that was really addressed. It was just like, here's a pill yeah. to help yeah. you feel better. So can you, can you go into like, you know, your journey as, as a therapist, like, you know, I I'm just curious from that side of the industry, like what's going on? How come those questions aren't being asked? That's a really good question because the way training is done, you are generally um, trained in one of two models, either a psychological model or a biomedical model, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. I, I came of age um, as a psychologist, I'm a psychologist, uh -huh. and my training was that depression, for example, is mostly a psychological problem that we see the brain changes in depression, that they're a result of unskillful behaviors. Now, I thought that was true for 80, 90% of depression for most of my life, up until maybe the 10, 15 years ago, I began to question that. Now, psychiatry, which has really become biopsychiatry, sees this as a medical mm -hmm. problem, that it's a brain dysfunction that mm -hmm. requires lifelong medication. Now, I've come to see, you know, I always thought it was like a chicken or an egg thing. And yeah. I now see it's a chicken and egg thing, that they're mm -hmm. both happening together. Mm -hmm. That there is a kind of brain dysfunction or a kind of what I'm thinking of is actually a kind of brain weakness that is setting in because of all the assaults in the brain. It's like, if you look at Wikipedia under neurotoxins, you find 200 pages of lists with about 30 neurotoxins on each page. So 6,000 neurotoxins in the environment that have never been there before, mm. each one with its own Wikipedia page. And we know some mm. of these, you know, mercury, lead, arsenic, um, but many of them go unrecognized. Um, plasticizers, plastics, um, pretty much everybody in the United States has levels of microplastics in their system. These are endocrine right. disruptors, which really affect brain function in a profound way. Um, smog, 90% of the wor world's population lives in smoggy areas. Mm -hmm. And these really fine particles, these 2.5 micron particles and below are so small, they are absorbed by the lungs into the bloodstream and they cross the blood brain barrier where they act like little wrecking balls in mm -hmm. the subtle, delicate fibers of the neurons, creating inflammation, 
chronic inflammation. And we know inflammation is behind most of the major illnesses, right? Cardiovascular yep, disease, sure. cancer, Alzheimer's. Yep. Um, another big one is pesticides. Um, glyphosate. Glyphosate um, in Roundup is the world's most used pesticide. 300 million pounds of it every year in the United States. More in China, in India, in Brazil. Glyphosate is an antibiotic. So it wipes out our microbiome, which we know is a bad thing. Yeah. But also it opens up the tight junctions of the intestines. So the tight junctions are what keeps out the bad stuff and lets in the good stuff. Yeah. So in opening up those tight junctions, we let in toxins into the body, which creates inflammation. And it also opens up the tight junctions of the brain, of the blood-brain barrier, which responds to the yeah. same molecular signals as the gut. So we get toxins into the brain as well, also creating inflammation. What these things do is, over time, they begin to degrade the functioning of the brain, begin to weaken the brain. The brain begins to slow down, right? So we see that the brain is this kind of moving organism. We sometimes think of the brain as like a computer, but that's a really terrible analogy because a computer is dead. The brain isn't like a static silicon chip. It's, a, it's like an amoeba. It's a, it's a moving, living growing organism. Mm. It's always in motion. Love that. It's always growing. So we've known about neuroplasticity for a few decades, which is how the brain is always making new connections in itself. But this recent discovery of neurogenesis, where the brain is making new brain cells, is fairly recent, yeah. like the last 15, 20 years. Mm. Right. It used to be thought that we stopped growing new brain cells in our early 20s, and then it was just one slow die off. And now they've realized that actually we make new brain cells throughout the entire lifespan, up until the day we die. In the past few years, it's become clear what the significance of this is. And it's this, that our neurogenic rate, that is the rate at which the brain is growing, new neurons, new synapses, new connections, is the most important biomarker for brain health that most people have never heard of. So they did an experiment with mice where they increased their neurogenic rate five times. And what they found was these mice became kind of like super mice. They were smarter, they learned things faster, they figured things out faster, they were more creative, and they were robustly emotionally resilient. They were protected against stress, anxiety, and depression. Mm. And people can also increase their neurogenic rate. That what happens when all of these neurotoxins hit us, because you know, it, it, it's death by a thousand cuts. It, you know, one or two we don't notice, not even 20 or 30, but after 100 or 200, we begin to falter. And as the brain slows down, as it gets more sluggish, then we get symptoms like mm -hmm. chronic stress, anxiety, depression, brain fog, cognitive decline. There are common neural mechanisms underlying all of these, but there are very different psychological processes for each of them. But addressing the underlying brain weakness, I think, is critical in all of this. And conventional psychi psychiatric medication doesn't do that. It simply covers the symptoms, which again, can be life-saving life for, for a short time. But over time, it, it doesn't help. S symptom suppression is not necessarily a good thing in the, in the long run. I love this talk so much. And I, I, I have so many insights to share because I feel that as I've lived the truth of what you're talking, I feel like I have I, I can own this about myself. I feel like I went from the regular mouse to the super mouse. I really do. Like I see that in my own life from my increasing my own neuroplasticity through the way that I'm eating, the way that I am exercising, um, going into intense bouts of um, high intensity interval training, um, increasing the quality of my food, like buying um, meat from regenerative ranches and pushing for organic and local and, um, and increasing just the quantity of plant foods that I'm eating that have been raised in a, in a healthy environment that way. Like I literally feel like I've gone and, you know, I don't know your feelings on this, but I, I do a lot of work with plant medicines 
hormones and psychedelics as too, which there's fascinating research on neuroplasticity with those and creating new neural pathways as well. And that's exactly how I feel. I feel like I went from living a life of being asleep like I just was purely in reactive mode, not even thinking about the world at large at all. Um, had a lot of unhealthy emotional patterns that I just w- had no idea. I just wasn't aware of. Um, I also do meditation now too, which I think is huge for that. So now it's like, I, I feel like a completely different person. And I went from this like stay at home mom that like cried herself to sleep at night because she felt bad because she didn't spend enough time with her five-year-old that day. Like, I mean, that's kind of like the, the life I I was living it to now, like, you know, I hang out with, with world changers and they're like, wow, I really like the way you think, you know, and that's, that's really interesting to me and my own personal life experience. And I feel like so much of that has come from doing things in my life that create a healthier environment in my brain, increasing my neuroplasticity. And I really do. I tell people that all the time. I'm like, I feel smarter. I feel, I always was smart. I was always academically driven, but I literally do feel smarter. So I love hearing this talk. Um, I want to dive deeper into that, but before we do, I want to ask you also about, you know, I love what you're saying, the chicken and egg. I like that because I feel the same way of like, I'm like, wait, is it your, is it your unhealthy emotional thoughts causing the detriment in your body? Or is it the detriment in your body causing you to be trapped in unhealthy emotional thoughts? Like, where does it start? I've definitely been in that chicken and egg like mindset. So I love what you're saying. It's this chicken and egg. So can we, can you speak on, um, now like the emotional patterning aspect of, you know, trauma or things that you learn from your parents or, um, more of like the psychological side of things. Sure. Sure. So anxiety, for example, has many different causes. Um, one of which you've just alluded to, which is PTSD, which is trauma. Yeah. Early trauma sort of puts the brain, puts the whole nervous system in a state of high alert, red alert. Yeah. Um, sympathetic dominant, right? We have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system, right? The sympathetic, like when a car just comes into your lane and you slam on the brakes, that's the sympathetic nervous system, right? Adrenaline pours mm-hmm. into your system. Parasympathetic system, you get back home, you take a warm bath, you relax, that's the, you digest, that's the parasympathetic sympathetic system. So we need to have a balance between both, but we are kind of a sympathetic dominant society right now. Yes. And so, you know, you turn on the news and it's like, you get a jolt of adrenaline just from the tone of voice that you hear in the announcers. Um, So when we have trauma, it sets the sympathetic nervous system in red alert. And that continues through our life where we are just hypervigilant. We are constantly on the lookout for the slightest thing that could set off that trauma once again. So undiagnosed or untreated PTSD is one cause of anxiety. Mm. Um, Another cause is anxiety is an unconscious signal. So one of Freud's big discoveries was what he called signal anxiety. Mm. Now, we there's a lot of talk about how we've gone beyond Freud and in many ways we have, but still some of the discoveries were really foundational for psychology and depth psychology in particular. And one of these discoveries was the discovery of signal anxiety. So when we're young, we learn that certain feelings, certain impulses, certain parts of ourselves are not okay. They're threatening to our parents. Mm. And so we learn to stay away from those in order to maintain the vital tie to our mother or our father. Wow. Or both. And so when those feelings come up over time, we erect defenses against them. Hmm. That means as this feeling, say anger is forbidden. So when anger begins to come up, the unconscious goes, uh-oh, uh-oh, danger, danger. Here comes anger, hmm. anxiety, anxiety. Right. The unconscious pushes it down before we even realize we're experiencing it. And slowly over time, the anxiety then calms back down. Wow. So signal anxiety is also quite prevalent. Signal anxiety is in some ways, it's kind of like the fear of being yourself. Yeah. Right. It's the fear of being your deepest feelings, your, who you really are. And the thing is you can't learn to get out of that by yourself. Because the conditioning keeps doing itself. 
Right. We, we learn what feelings are okay and not okay in relationship, in relationship with our parents and our family right. first. But then with a therapist or with a loving partner or friends, we can learn other ways of accepting our feelings. Wow. So these feelings need to be brought into relationship and accepted. Beautiful. So it's a it's a relational cure wow. for signal anxiety. Um, another that. another cause is um, poor emotion regulation, poor mm. self soothing structures. Mm. So sort of the prototype of soothing is when the baby is crying and the mother picks up the baby and soothes it. Right? She holds it. She strokes it. She speaks softly to the baby. She allows her nervous system, her calmness, mm. to entrain the nervous system of the baby. And slowly the baby becomes calm. Mm. With, re with repetitions of this, multiple repetitions of this, the baby begins to internalize this. And so when the baby gets, when the child then, getting older, it gets upset and the mother isn't there, the child is able to say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You've been through this before. Don't worry about this. Or later on in life through meditation or something else, we can connect with a deeper source of peace inside, right? Peace really comes from our spiritual center, from our spiritual core. And when we connect with that, we can then bring that outward into our outer being, our surface being. So there are different ways in which we can self-soothe, self-calm. And many people have inadequate self-soothing structures. And so they resort to alcohol, drugs, shopping, compulsive activity, workaholism, you name the addiction, um, as a way to calm down rather than being able to do that internally. Mm, wow. Um, so question for you on um, going, I, I find all of these reasons so fascinating. I want to dive into them a little bit more on the hypervigilance uh, with, with trauma. Do you have, do you find that that is more like localized to the, the trauma? So let's say um, I'll just be very vulnerable and share. Like I had a relationship that was very um, like manipulative and controlling. And I really truly do believe that he is like textbook clinical narcissist. It's like every single thing, like legitimate narcissistic personality disorder, not just like he's self-absorbed. I mean, it's like every checklist. And because of that, as a result for myself, like I find like I, I have been hyper vigilant in subsequent dating relationships. Like you're not going to manipulate me. I'm going to see through stuff. Are you really telling me the truth or is there something else going on underlying that? I, and I'm going to, I, I, I use the word hyper vigilant. I'm like, I feel like I'm hyper vigilant because I like don't want to face that um, pain again. Right. And so would you say like for that? And I, and I can see what you mean because the anxiety comes where I'm like all up in my head of like, Hmm, I wonder if he's saying that, but he really means this. And I'm like stewing on it. So it does feel like anxiety. Um, and so my question is, do you find like with PTSD, is it localized to like just that stuff or in general, do you feel like it makes the person more hyper vigilant about dangers around them in general? Yeah, I think it depends on the situation. Sometimes, like for example, early sexual trauma can, it generalizes mostly just to sexual relationships. Um, that's where it becomes, or intimacy, that's where it becomes, the anxiety really comes up. Mm. Um, I worked with this other person who um, at any time of the day or night, he would get jumped by one of his brothers. Mm. And he walked around with just a general sense of danger in the world. Right. The world was not safe. I see. And until he dealt with that, um, he was anxious continually. Mm. Um, you know, there's many different ways of treating all of this. Yeah. And, and one, of the, uh, um, one of the ways of looking at anxiety is that it is blocked excitement. Hmm. So in Gestalt, anxiety is seen like two things happen in anxiety. We move into our heads, jump into the future and start mm -hmm. catastrophizing. Mm -hmm. Secondly, in our body, we stop breathing. We hold our mm -hmm. breath. Mm -hmm. So in order to do something requires a certain amount of excitement. 
a certain amount of life force. Mm. So for example, when a, a stage performer gets on stage, when the actor starts performing, they may experience some stage fright. But as they get into their performance, as they get into their lines and, and moving mm -hmm. with the performance, then it becomes a very alive performance, right? If they didn't have that excitement to begin with, mm -hmm. they'd give a very flat, dull yeah. performance. Mm -hmm. But as they start breathing, as they start getting into it, then it comes alive. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same with anxiety, that as it's like anxiety doesn't go away it diminishes, but it transforms into excitement. Hmm. So as these, as I say, my feelings become more acceptable, acceptable to me, or the world becomes less dangerous, then I stop going into my head and future catastrophizing. Mm -hmm. And I let myself breathe with the excitement, right? Excitement requires increased metabolic support in the form of more oxygen. Mm -hmm. I need to let myself breathe, but in anxiety, I hold my breath. I think the word anxiety itself actually comes from some Latin angustio or something meaning tightening of the chest. Mm. We hold our breath. So mm. when I'm feeling anxious, I need to breathe. I need to come into the present moment. And I need to see what it is that I'm afraid of. Mm -hmm. What it is that's going on. What's mm -hmm. happening here. And are there ways that I can let myself soothe myself, calm myself? Um, are there... There's many different ways of, of doing that. And that's something, again, that therapy, I think, is really helpful for learning yeah. how to self-calm, self-soothe. Yeah, man, I love this so much because I'm, I'm hearing like, um, I think a lot as I'm looking at uh, instances of anxiety when I feel anxious, it's generally I feel like because I I'm not able to identify what's really going on with me. Like, I don't understand the root cause of it or what the root fear is and what you're talking about with um, signaling, I think is super interesting too, because that's going to be really hard to identify like that you are feeling bad about yourself because anger is coming up and it's, 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 it hasn't even come yet, but you're like, I mean, that's, that's so such unconscious behavior. Um, it really, to me leads to like, man, like it, it's worth it for all of us to really kind of dive into our childhood with some sort of therapist or coach that works into those stories. So you can become aware because otherwise you're right. Like those, those blind spots, I don't see how you would ever be able to see them because you're not even aware of what stories you've created because they're so real for you. Yeah, that's exactly right. That, that That's the thing with unconscious defenses, right? They're unconscious. So we, right. we're not aware of them. That's you the even know what you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. So it's helpful to have somebody else who's aware of that, be able to point it out and help us see it. Yes. Yeah. And I love what you're saying too about relationships um, because I, I do personal development coaching and as part of my love and passion for personal development, I've definitely learned that you can only get so far by yourself. Like <laughs> you definitely, you need, you need a mirror. And, and if you can have somebody like, I'm very grateful for my boyfriend that I have now because we serve as kind and loving and accepting mirrors for each other. Like it's a very gentle, but like, Hey, I just noticed, like, it seems like you're like, being really hard on yourself about that one thing. Like what, why do you think that is, you know, and we, we'll dive into it together. And it's really beautiful. Cause it's like, Oh my gosh. Like, cause when I was little, I used to, <laughs> it, that wasn't okay. Oh wow. I didn't. And so it's that having somebody who's kind and supportive and safe to be able to reflect to you and care. Like, I'm not judging you for it. I just like, I want to help you feel better. And I just am pointing out like it does, that seems like it's causing you a lot of stress. Um, you can't, you can't do that alone. You can't yeah, see it alone. Yeah. So I love your, uh, your perspective on that. Yeah, no, beautiful example. Yeah. I, I really appreciate how you're using yourself as an example here of, of <laughs> everything that we're talking about. It really makes it more real. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I like, I like to see my shadows. Um, I, I have a, I guess I have a like spirit animal, which is pretty hilarious. Um, I never thought I would, but it's an Eagle and, and I, and I love flying. I love, like, I love birds. I love admiring how they, they can fly and soar. And, um, and I always think of my shadows are tethers you know, and if I can, if I can see some of those things that are holding me back that are in there, like invisible tethers, then I can fly a little higher and I can fly a little higher. So for me, it's almost become fun to be willing to like rip myself wide open and just be like, Hey, it's okay. I'm having compassion about it, but there's some, there's some stuff here, some invisible tethers that might be holding back. And if you can just look at them, then you can cut them and you can fly a little higher. Won't that be fun? You know? So it's kind of how I look at it. Um, 
Okay. So I want to dive a little more to, into the, the holistic, cause you're, you specialize in the, in this holistic healing. And, and I want to come back a little bit more now into like, okay, what do we do now? There's awareness, you know, and I think, am I hearing from you? First of all, like before we get into like the talk about like neurotoxins and things like that more, um, Am I hearing from you that it would be worthy for all of us maybe to like <laughs> see a therapist or coach or something, you know, when would you recommend that somebody like, cause okay, I guess, well, here's what I'm trying to say. When I was feeling a lot of anxiety about like relationships, for example, that was just real for me. I didn't think I had anxiety. I thought that was just reality. I thought I was just being smart. I thought I was just like being observant and wise and making sure that I saw what was really going on here. And <laughs> I didn't think of it as anxiety. And it wasn't until I got into the relationship that I'm in now where I realized, Oh my gosh, I'm getting really caught up in these stories. And they're actually not even, that's not really what's happening. Oh my gosh, something's going on here. I didn't have the awareness. So like, do you think it's worthy to say for people to really, um, maybe consider just hiring a therapist or a coach just to find out some of these stories that they might not even be seeing when, if they have an area of chronic stress in their life? I do. I'm a big believer in this. I think it's, I think therapy and coaching, it, it's, it's too good just for sick people. It's, yeah. It's for everybody. It's like, we all need it. Right. We're all wounded. We're all hurt. We're all struggling. <laughs> yeah. We all need help in our growth, in our healing and nobody I, can do it alone. So I'm yeah. a big believer in, again, working both sides of it, the, the health side and this relational psychological side or psycho-spiritual even side. Yes. Yeah. It feels like we're, we're kind of past, like, let's wait until you're so broken that you can't operate. Like it's, it's almost like um, therapy and coaching is more of like an optimization thing now. Like we're all yes. willing to admit that we have stuff. And so if you really want to optimize your life, like it's, it's more of a, it feels like more of a proactive thing that you would do from a healthy standpoint versus like, oh, you've, you're really messed up. You better go get fixed or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. It's like we're we're in the kind of the brain optimization space. That, right. That's okay. But it's also the self optimization space as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So so let's dive in a little deeper into the holistic, you know, with the strategies. What do you see as being the most effective for people to really take a look at if they want to optimize um, and 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 be able to do all the things that you just said? Where where does a person start? Okay. Good. So we ex in a holistic perspective, we exist on different levels, right? Body, heart mind, spirit, all four levels mm. uh, we exist on, but we experience them all through the brain and through the self. So I think it's really helpful to be able to intervene on all of these because mm -hmm. anxiety or depression or cognitive decline, it's a kind of unique signature for everybody, what the meaning of it is, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And we need to kind of find what is it for us? What is the meaning of this for us? And again, as we're talking about, it's not just the symptoms that we're trying to get rid of. We're really trying to get into a peak brain performance. Yeah. Um, so a big part of this certainly is the physical foundation of the brain that pretty much everybody suffers from some degree of brain weakness, I think, just given all of the neurotoxins, right? Yeah. UCSF did a study where they found a few years ago, 93% of Americans have measurable levels of glyphosate in their system. Everybody has plastics in their system. It's like there's a certain amount of this, which is just unavoidable. If you live in the Midwest or the South, glyphosate is in the dust. It's in the rain. They use so much of it. Wow. So just about everybody is suffering from some degree of... Hmm brain weakening, I think, in mm. this. And so I think the first step is to really strengthen and heal the brain. And so a big part of that, there's exercise, there's sleep, but a big part of it, I think, is diet because we need to rebuild the brain. We need to get the brain moving again. Mm. In the same way that movement is really important for the physical body, right? Sitting is the new smoking. I mean, we need to be moving our bodies. Mm -hmm. It's the same with the brain. The brain needs to get its neurogenic rate up and going. So in the book, I talk about the four pillars of what I think of as the healthy brain diet. Neurogenic, ketogenic, anti-inflammatory, 
and gut friendly. Each of those has a big effect on the brain. So, but the most important of these is neurogenic. Hmm. So we want to increase the brain's level of BDNF, which is brain derived neurotrophic factor. It's the kind of miracle grow for the brain. It gets neuroplasticity going and it gets neurogenesis going, right? Mm -hmm. The creation of new brain cells. So there's a number of, there's about 30 or 40 different nutrients that the book goes into. Probably the most important would be omega-3s. Hmm. Most people need three to four grams every day with an equal balance of EPA and DHA. So the omega-3s have ALA, they have EPA, which is a big anti-inflammatory, and they have DHA. Now, DHA is the fundamental building block of the brain. So the brain is made up of about 60% fat. And of that, a third to a half of it is DHA. So <clears throat> they did an experiment with monkeys where they fed a group of monkeys on a low omega-3 diet and another group on a high omega-3 diet. And then they looked at their brains afterwards. <clears throat> and the monkeys who were on the low omega-3 diet had very simple, undifferentiated brains. But the monkeys on the high omega-3 diet had very complex, richly differentiated brains, almost like humans. Mm -hmm. Particularly if you have kids, you got to feed them lots of DHA. It is the mm -hmm. fundamental building block of the brain. Mm -hmm. Christine Thuray, a neuroscientist at the University of London, increased neurogenesis by 40% simply by adding omega-3s into the diet. Very and cool. We, and I just have to interject a quick side note on that. I am such a believer in what you're saying. And so if you have kids, you can get like those flavored, higher quality, like fish oil, it's like coconut swirl or whatever. That is a huge part of my kids. Like I don't have them take a lot of stuff, but I am like, I feel like the future of their brain health is in my hand. So I'm adamant about making sure that they take some of my older ones do the krill oil, like, um, um, little soft gels or whatever now, but when, even as little kids, like I do, I, I just a side note, if you want something, you get that on Amazon, get one that needs to be refrigerated. It's a little higher quality, but yeah, I, I just had to do a plug for that. Yeah. Great. And also get it molecularly distilled mm. because do you have one distilled. that you recommend um, Nordic naturals. Okay. Yeah. Makes one. They are, they are molecularly distilled and they also make a DHA extra which has high amount of DHA. Most have more EPA in them than DHA. Why does it need to be molecularly distilled? So it doesn't have any mercury in it. Oh, okay. Because mercury concentrates in fish and it comes out yeah. of fish oil unless it's molecularly distilled. Okay, got and it. Mercury is, I think, the second most powerful neurotoxin known, second only to, to plutonium. Are you, are you, um, on board with krill? I like krill. What I have read about krill is that it's less likely to have high, very much the, the mercury content because it's such a small, um, animal and because it's, um, I mean, it has a million other reasons, but are you a fan of krill oil? Um, the only problem with krill oil is that you don't get that much of it. Generally, generally they have much smaller amounts and okay. I think most people need three to four grams a day. Yeah. I usually take very little. And I, ha I have my clients take a lot. I'm like, it's going to be a little expensive, but yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing is turmeric or curcumin, a powerful um, neurogenic stimulator. Um, hesperidin is a bioflavonoid derived from citrus fruits. And it also is a very powerful um, BDNF stimulator, and it also keeps new brain cells alive. Really? Hesperidin? Is that what you said? Hesperidin. Hesperidin. How do you spell that? H-E-S-P-E-R-I-D-I-N. Okay, thank you. And the kind to get is called methylchalcone. It's eight times more bioavailable than the other kinds. Um, green tea is also really good. We need ideally 10 to 15 cups, but we don't want that much caffeine. So you can get a caffeine-free extract in just a capsule, which is very helpful. Um, so there's luteolin, there's apigenin. The book goes into a number of these, but the idea is we need to get our brain once again moving. As it gets moving, anxiety begins to fade, depression begins to leave. You know, just one side note on SSRIs and sort of the whole antidepressant um, 
pharmaceutical industry. It's a $15 billion a year industry right mm -hmm. now. And it was based on this idea of a serotonin deficiency, right? That the brain has a serotonin deficiency. We take SSRIs, there's more serotonin, person comes, comes becomes undepressed. Turns out there is no serotonin deficiency. Mm. Um, most of the studies, the vast majority of studies show that people who are depressed have normal levels of serotonin. Mm. Some show that they actually have higher than normal levels. Mm -hmm. And there's a few that show they have lower than normal levels. So what works with antidepressants is not that it's making up for some mythical serotonin deficiency, which does not exist. But the increase in serotonin stimulates neurogenesis. Whoa. And it's that which, so they wondered why. Oh my since, gosh. If serotonin levels rise immediately. Why doesn't the person become not depressed immediately? It takes four to six weeks to work. Well, that's how long it takes new brain cells to mature and come online and get integrated into the existing circuitry of the brain. So wow. the pharmaceutical companies know this, but they've got a good thing going, right? They want to sell more product. Um, I have a client actually whose cat is on Prozac at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wait, question for you then. Like now my mind is going to like, wait, well, if it's increasing neurogenesis, would that in some way make a, an SSRA a good thing for increasing yes, neuroplasticity? But are, yeah, in some ways, yes. Sometimes they can be really good. Again, there are many more natural ways of increasing mm -hmm. neurogenesis than that. And there are also side effects. Right. Also, they don't work for less for, I mean, they, they work for less than half of the people and they you know, have side effects such as loss of libido, um, loss of sex drive. Um, and that's kind of depressing too. And, and then you become kind of dependent on them and right. And from what I've heard from that's most right. people, they feel less effect from them after a while. They feel like they're not even working anymore. Yeah, and, Is that? Yeah. And many people talk about a kind of emotional numbing almost that mm. happens. Um, mm. And then your body begin, your brain begins to downregulate the production of serotonin. Right, so right. It becomes harder and harder to get off of them. Right. Okay. Thank you. So that's one pillar, neurogenic. Okay. Second pillar is ketogenic in the healing phase and then low carb in the maintenance phase. Um, I was going to ask you about that because I specialize in the ketogenic diet. Well, you do. Yeah, I uh, do. So okay. I was like, afterwards, I was going to be like, I wonder if he does keto. He's got it. If he likes uh -huh. BDNF and, and omega threes uh -huh. and brain health, he's got to do keto. Okay. So that is already part of what you teach. Yes. Yes. Um, ketones are neurogenic. So they're great that way. They decrease inflammation and yeah. anxiety is an inflammatory process. Depression is an inflammatory process. Cognitive decline is an inflammatory mm -hmm. process. Alzheimer's hugely inflammatory process. Um, mm -hmm. And the word that's being used with uh, neuroscience researchers around ketogenic diets is neuroprotective. Yeah. That ketones are neuroprotective, right? So they're being used with epilepsy, they're being yep. used with Parkinson's, they're being used with Alzheimer's. And the brain just works better when it's fueled by ketones. Yeah. Um, Richard Veach, um, Harvard researcher, um, who investigated the metabolic uh, benefits of a ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. said that the heart's mitochondria work 28% better mm -hmm. on ketones. Well, the brain's mitochondria are very similar to the heart's. So if you can imagine your brain operating at 28% greater efficiency, right? It feels like you are operating on a little higher level. Yep. There's a kind of clarity, yep. there's a kind of stability where it becomes hard to go back to just being a sugar burner after yeah. you've been on ketones for a while, after you've been fueling your brain with ketones. I'll share the truth of this for me right now. So I, um, when I'm in a ketogenic state, I, I literally feel like a superhuman. Like I, I, it feels like you're like, I see everything now. I mean, it really feels like that. I, it's almost like I can tell when I have kicked into ketosis. Cause I'm like, Oh, there it is. I, I literally feel like I can, my visually see better, um, mm -hmm. is like a, a, for me personally. And, um, and I, and I, my mental capacity is just insane. And right now I'm actually doing a self experiment where I'm doing a bikini competition, which is very outside of my comfort zone as part of the reason I've done it. It's because I've been very judgmental on that whole industry. Um, so I'm jumping in and experimenting and finding out for myself, but my fats are very low. I'm eating 44 grams of fat a day and coming from a ketogenic world. That's 
oof, um, an interesting challenge. So I've been using, um, ketone esters and also MCT oil as needed because I'm, I'm just not willing to, to go to, to brain dead. Um, but it's, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Um, I've been sharing, I was sharing with my boyfriend. I almost feel, I was like, I almost feel less tapped into my intuition, if that makes sense. Um, without, um, fueling as much fat. So I've just been, I've learned, I have to really be on top of my, my omegas and, and even using ketones and MCTs to increase my own ketone production for the brain. So I've, I've lived like what you're saying. I'm kind of living that, uh, reality right now. And I sometimes am not, I sometimes am a sugar burner from an athletic performance standpoint, I like to go really hard and, and, and sports performance. And so I will use carbs because of that, but the brain you're, you're, I mean, I, I, I stand as witness of what you're saying. Like the brain and a ketogenic state is it's unreal. Like, um, it feels like you are seeing life at a whole nother level. Yeah. 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 That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So neurogenic, ketogenic, anti-inflammatory right? Um, we live in an inflammatory culture. Um, the politics is inflammatory um, and our diets are inflammatory. The standard American diet is hugely inflammatory. So omega-6s are pro-inflammatory and we need a certain amount of them in order to mount an inflammatory response for a cold or heal a wound. But the problem is when that inflammation doesn't turn off and it becomes chronic inflammation. So we need a balance between omega-3s, which are anti-inflammatory, and omega-6s, which are pro-inflammatory. So evolutionarily, it seems like we evolved with a one-to-one -one omega-3 to omega-6 balance, or maybe a one-to-two. But the standard American diet is one-to-20, or even one-to-30, yeah. highly inflammatory. That inflammation chews up our blood vessels on the inside, wreaks havoc in all systems of the body, but particularly the brain. When the brain is on fire, again, we get anxiety, depression, cognitive decline. And a good test for just about everybody to do for their yearly physical is called a high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Yeah. It's a general inflammatory marker. And if your levels are over 0.5 for a man or 1.0 for a woman, it would be very good to start bringing your inflammatory levels down very yeah. quickly. I, and the, I love that. Go ahead. I was going to say, um, on the omega six and omega three ratio thing. I also just recently had my omega six, omega three ratio, um, tested and it was off. And I was like, man, because I've gotten a little bit lazy with my krill oil. Um, and, and I don't eat, I hard, you know, I'm very avoidant of canola oils and, and uh, the inflammatory foods, mm -hmm. but even, you know, even eating as healthy as I do, just not supplementing consistently with my krill oil, the way I, you know, <laughs> know that I need to my ratio was off. So I was like, wow. Okay. And you imagine somebody who's just eating like fast food and, and processed boxed foods all the time. And they're for, probably for sure not taking krill oil. And a lot of Americans don't eat seafood very often either. And so it's just like, think how inflamed the average American is. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. And then the last is gut friendly. So we not only need to sort of heal the tight junctions of our intestines, but we need to increase the, um, the diversity of our microbiome ecosystem. Yeah. So most people know that we've got a lot of bacteria down there. Um, they used to think they had more bacteria down there than we had cells in the body, but they've recounted, it looks like it's about the same, about 40 trillion, about 40 trillion cells in the body and about 40 trillion bacteria down there. And in indigenous cultures, they've got about 20,000 strains of bacteria, which is very healthy. In the West, we generally have about 10,000 strains, which is not great for the immune system since 80% of our immune system is in the microbiome. Many people only have 500 or a thousand or a few thousand strains. So any ecosystem which is diverse is more resilient. The smaller it is, the less diverse it is, the less resilient it is. So we want to increase microbial diversity. And also, there are certain bacterial strains which have been shown to be helpful with anxiety and depression and with cognitive decline. They did this one set of experiments with mice who were genetically bred to be anxious. 
and another set of mice who were genetically bred to be fearless explorers. And they took the microbe from biome from each and they transplanted them into the other. And the anxious mice became fearless explorers and the fearless explorers became anxious, scared mice. So the microbiome trumps mm. genetics, mm. or rather it, it throws the epigenetic switches towards low depression, low anxiety. Mm. So there are some strains of bacteria, the book goes into these, that have been shown to reduce anxiety and depression scores by 50%. And there have been others that have been shown to raise cognition scores. Uh, so wow. our microbiome is hugely important in this. And we also want to increase the diversity of it by eating a lot more fiber, by being in nature, just breathing yes. in nature. Yes. We're breathing in hundreds of strains of bacteria, which get into the, the throat, eventually down into the gut. Um, my kids make fun of me because when we go, I live in Utah in Salt Lake City, so oh, we have access to incredible nature, and I'm so grateful for yeah. it. We'll go hiking, and I'm, <laughs> I'm literally like rubbing dirt all over me. I'm like, I want it all. I want it all. I'm like getting in the water. I'm like as much exposure to this as I can get. I want it. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. 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 Wow. So, so those four pillars: neurogenic, ketogenic, anti-inflammatory, gut-friendly. Mm. Those begin to heal the brain Beautiful. and they begin to also heal how we feel, right? Because 80% of our neurotransmitters actually come from the gut. The microbiome produces 80% of the serotonin, dopamine, all that. Not all of it gets past the blood-brain barrier, but some of it does. So that's an important part of how we feel. And also the vagus nerve runs yeah. through there is an important part of how we feel. Man, you got it. You got it nailed. Like it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to hear, you know, like your life's work and everything that you've come across and you s clearly stay on the cutting edge of what's coming out in, in the research and science and so, like putting it all together. I'm very excited to read your book. And I know I bet anyone who's listening is, and, um, the book that you're referring to in this one is the holistic healing for anxiety, depression, and cognitive de decline. Right. Cause I know you have several books. Yes. Okay, great. So we'll, we'll link that in the show notes. And I don't want to take too much more of your time. I know we really, we got into the Brain, but when you were talking about like body, heart, mind, spirit, I'm assuming that these these categories are broken down in the book as well. That's right. That's right. That meditation, for example, two different types of meditation have shown to have a very powerful neurogenic effect, like extraordinarily powerful. Mm -hmm. um, mindfulness practices and heart opening practices have both been shown to have a very powerful effect on the whole length of the hippocampus in terms of neurogenesis and throughout the brain in terms of neuroplasticity. You know, they didn't think that meditation had much of an effect on the brain because it looks like nothing's happening, right? Mm -hmm. But if you meditate, you realize it's actually a very dynamic state. Yeah. There's a lot going on in the brain. And that it has this True. very powerful effect on affect, on cognition, as well as neurogenesis. You're saying mindfulness practices versus heart opening. Can you um, expand on that just a little bit? Sure. So I think of mindfulness practices as having two categories, concentration practices and open awareness practices. Mm. Concentration practices would be things like focusing on the breath, mm. right? Just the subtle sensations of the breath as it comes and as it goes. You just simply observe the sensations of the body as you breathe, you don't try to breathe, you just let yourself breathe and observe it. And slowly over time, you become more and more aware of subtler and subtler sensations. Mm -hmm. The mental chatter begins to kind of settle down and you come more and more into the present. You can do different types of concentration practices like that. The other type of mindfulness practices are open awareness practices, where you're simply aware of whatever arises in consciousness. Mm -hmm. simply allowing it to arise and pass away, not holding on, not judging, right. simply allowing it to arise and pass away and seeing how noisy our mind is. Mm -hmm. But then over time, the dust begins to settle and we wake up. We become more and more in the present. We come more and more into our senses, mm -hmm. more and more into the body, more and more into this present moment. Yeah. So I think those are the two major forms of mindfulness practices, and they've both Beautiful. been shown to have huge effects on the brain. 
Yeah. I feel like every like highly successful person, I read their book or something there, they always credit meditation <laughs> to being part of it. So you know that there's gotta be some sort of like uh, potential for human advancement that comes from it. Like it's just, I've heard it so many times. That's why I started meditating. Mm. Cause I was like, I just have heard so many people that I want to be like, say that they do this. I'm going to do it too. <laughs> so, um, and then heart opening, uh, heart. Oh, yeah. Heart opening would be things like devotional prayer, um, practices where say you focus in the heart area and mm -hmm. focus on love for the divine mm -hmm. or love for Jesus or Krishna or mm -hmm. some saint mm -hmm. or simply the aspiration for the divine. And you simply ride that feeling deeper and deeper into the heart. Mm. And as you do that, the heart opens, the gates of the heart open. Mm. And we connect to the deeper soul within, the, the divinity within. Um, wow. Of course, these are lifelong practices for most yeah. of us. Um, but this also has been shown to have quite a robust effect on neurogenesis and wow. synaptogenesis in the brain. Wow. Thanks for, it's interesting. Cause I, I definitely do that. My, my life is led by the divine. I'm constantly mm -hmm. saying like, mm -hmm. what can I do? What, what's next? What else do you need help with? Like, I'm here, I'm ready to serve. Like I, I live that way. And I hadn't even identified that I just live like that, but it's interesting to hear your, um, your input on how that can affect our brain health and their genesis. Yeah. So fascinating. Yeah. Um, and let's see. So we, we, kind of hit on, you know, I guess the one we didn't really hit was spirit or, or is that kind of wrapped into the meditation? That is, that, that's, okay. we're, we're definitely there. Um, okay. So yeah. we kind of touched on all of the, we gave a little taste of all the different aspects. To yeah. Hold. The mental piece is sort of looking at our cognitions and stuff like that. That's pretty simple, but um, mm. we've touched on the emotional side to some degree, the dietary okay. side. Um, and now the spiritual side. Yeah. Okay. And so the mental side would be a little bit more of like the self soothing and, and learning how to that, manage yes. your and, mind. And our our self-talk, you know, our, yeah. our shoulds, right. uh, our self-criticism, our self-judgment, right. Uh, beginning to soften that beginning to really move from, you know, self-judgment transmutes also. So it stops becoming judgmental and becomes more and more discerning. And, mm. and discriminating. So being non-judgmental doesn't mean we don't have any sense of discernment. Um, it just means that we're no longer seeing that I'm a bad person or you're a bad person or we're making right. those judgments, right. which are inflammatory, right? When I yeah. actually, when I judge myself like that and I feel shame, shame is inflammatory. Mm. It hurts the brain, you know? Wow. These emotional states like chronic stress, yeah. It hurts the brain. It, over time, it becomes inflammatory and the brain actually shrinks with chronic stress, with chronic anxiety, with chronic depression. In fact, you can measure the longer a person has been depressed, the greater the cognitive um, shrinkage, that there, the, the greater the, the cortical wow. shrinkage that there wow. is. Wow. I love that. I do. Um, I work with a facilitator of the work of Byron Katie. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but sure, it's a lot yeah. about yeah. removing those self judgments and it yes. definitely has impacted others. It's made me so much more open where I'm like, Oh, like myself, my compassion for myself and others has gone up tremendously from that, that practice. I mean, everything you're hitting on, um, is just, it's so good. I can't wait. To, is your book on audible by the chance, by chance? It's not, unfortunately. Oh. Um, I should get it on there. You yeah. should. And your voice is so soothing. You should read it. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to, okay. I'm going to push for that. Cause I love audible makes, um, you know, my life, I'm able to take uh -huh. in so much more is wisdom and, and knowledge because of that, but I'm going to have to actually sit down and read your book. Cause I really think that you've put all this together, like so beautifully and with so much wisdom. So Thank you. Um, again, you guys, the name of the book that he's referring to is Holistic Healing for Anxiety, Depression, and Cognitive, Cognitive Decline. But go to his website. It's just Brant Courtright, his first and last name, um, dot com. And I'll put it in the show notes on, on YouTube and also on all the podcast platforms because he has a host of other um, services there. So for coaching and therapy, is that something you, they can still reach out about consultations sure. if someone wanted sure. to work with you directly? Absolutely. Yeah, I do online work as well as in-person work. Yes. Awesome. Awesome guys. So that's, yeah, it's just Brant court, right? It's C O R T R I G H T, um, dot com. And I'll link that again. And man, Dr. Courtright, thank you so much for taking time and sharing this with, with us today. There's a, you can feel the, um, 
the peace that's inside of you from, from living what you're speaking, uh, like speaks on a soul level when, when you speak. So thank you. Feel the truth of, of what you're teaching today. So oh, thank it's you so been much. a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me.